Everything. Yeah. Anything? Any questions? We're going to keep focus on the America. All right, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Dean's Leadership Series. I am Ina Mani Jamal, and I am honored to have a chance today to sit down with Krish Bajna, Bajna Raja, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of. Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, which is headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland, which is also home of our Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and, sorry, our Associate Dean for Public Affairs um, and Communications, Miji Bell. LIRS has been in existence for over 80 years and is one of the only nine refugee resettlement agencies in the nation that are authorized by the State Department to bring refugees into the United States. Since 1939, LIRS has resettled over a half a million refugees. We are going to talk more in a moment about the organization and how it is working to address the global refugee crisis. But first, let me introduce our guest. Chris was appointed as president and CEO of LIRS in, in 2019. She is a three-time graduate of Yale, having earned her bachelor's, master's, and law degree from there. Of course, we won't hold that against her. <laughs> She was also a Marshall Scholar at Oxford University, where she received a Master of Philosophy in International Relations. She spent her summers in college working for Senator Paul Sarvanet, who was also a friend of the school. Trish practiced law for some time and then went into public service. She worked at the State Department as Senior Advisor under Secretary Hillary Clinton and Secretary of State John Kerry, where she coordinated development and implementation of multiple programs including those concerning refugees and migration, engagement with religious communities, and legal dimensions of U.S. foreign policy and regional issues related to Africa and the Middle East. Prior to her appointment at LIRS, she served in the Obama White House as policy director for First Lady Michelle Obama and led the First Lady signature Let, Get, Let, Let Girls Learn initiative, a really awesome initiative. And I am told that between leaving the White House and being appointed at LIRS, she flexed her political muscles and ran for governor of Maryland. Quite a dynamic career. Welcome to Princeton, Chris. We really appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. So let's just dive in if you may. Absolutely. And, you know, we want this to be dynamic. So if you want to ask us questions, by all means, you can. But for now, we're going to focus on you. Very good. Before we get into more about your organization or what your organization is doing to address the global refugee crisis, I thought it would be interesting to talk first about your own background, if we may. Your family fought the civil war in Sri Lanka when you were a child and came to the United States. You know that I also come from Palestinian background and my, my parents also came to the United States. Can you, can you talk a bit about how that experience changed, changed, shaped your childhood and your commitment to public service and influence the work that you do today. Yeah, well, um, thank you so much for coming out. I know it's a, it's a busy time of year. It um, really means a lot to see all of you here, especially some old friends um, in the audience as well. Um, it gives you an inferiority complex in the sense that, you know, my parents made a decision in their 40s to leave a country on the brink of civil war, uh, to move halfway across the globe with no jobs, um, just $200 in their pockets and two very young kids in their arms. And so anytime I think like, this is challenging, or, you know, is this the right thing to do? I'm just like, well, I have an inferiority complex because my parents played so real politics. But, um, you know, I think maybe like you, I realized what a game-changing, life-saving decision that was for us, right? Because whether we had stayed in Sri Lanka, um, part of the ethnic and religious minority, uh, whether we had moved to Nigeria, so my parents actually had plane tickets and uh, bag tax um, to move there because they were teachers in Nigeria and actually recruited. Um, I know my life would have been very, very different. And so in some ways, it, it's that keep on your story, but in some ways, it's that fire in your belly because you sort of feel like you owe it. Um, I don't know if you've got some saving private lines going in the room, but it's like earn it, right? Um, so it. I think drove a lot of what was many years clock in school. Um, I always find introductions interesting because what felt like a process of elimination and a very circuitous route is made eloquently into seeming like such a linear strategic path 
Um, I wish I could say I had a grand strategy in mind, um, but I think what really drove me was realizing that I was lucky. Um, my parents took a jackpot by coming to this country, um, and feeling very fortunate, uh, we were, um, you know, we moved to Maryland, um, and I think it was that warm welcome that my family was given that allowed uh, the daughter of educators to go to. Um, you know, to, I would I would say you know, the best, but I realize I'm here at Princeton, so I'll say, yes, uh, thank you know, very um, much. The many <laughs> wonderful illustrious institutions, um, uh, but it, it really has been to drive it. I didn't focus on immigration uh, for much of my career, but when this opportunity came up, it really did feel like a blessing and a calling because it was my chance to work on an immigrant on an issue that impacted me in such a beneficial way. But that I hadn't really focused on until fifteen years ago. That's wonderful. That's wonderful that um, Chris just to sort of deviate off the script. You know, so many people, uh, you know, find their path, but but don't think about how they might give back or to you know participate in public service in ways that will open the door for other people. Was that part of your strategizing around where you ended up now? Yeah, I mean, I think. We felt, um, if, you know, you got to think early on, right, about what makes you tick. And for me, um, and you just probably saw it when she I pulled up in my beat up Prius, uh, <laughs> um, cars, uh, you know, watching um, uh, money doesn't um, make me tick. I mean, it pays the bills, uh, but it, um, for me, it has always been public service in one shape or form. Um, earlier in my career, it really had been policy. I, you know, I've been at academia for a while. It felt um, like that place where you can have the seismic impact you want, right, at, at, at that federal or global level. Um, I made a shift when I decided to move from policy to politics in running for office, and happy to talk a little bit about that because that was certainly not planned. Um, but then, you know, the nonprofit space was something that I had dabbled in. I had done internships um, with organizations, but not really committed myself to that. And being in a nonprofit space, what I really have loved is it, it takes a policy issue, but puts you on the front line right. in a way that has been very different from um, other parts of my career, where whether I was in school or in the federal government, it, was, it still felt more abstract. Right. Um, you're in the trenches every day. Um, so this is awesome, and I'm going to deviate again off the script, so I'm looking at me, she's not going to be too happy, but uh, so this is, I, I enjoy this conversation with when, when, when I have the opportunity to go to lunch or dinner with colleagues who are really in the trenches, and what I'd like to ask them is, what is that aha moment that when you go home at night, and you know, you're, you're, you're barely in, you know, you, you, the, the Prius is beat up, and it's a long day, that you say, I'm so happy I'm doing this work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, it's an easier one to answer just because we were in Phoenix, Arizona last week. Um, and it is every time you get to interact with the client. Um, so last week we had our board meetings and we did um, some visits to our, our, our affiliate in our offices there. And one moment, it was actually the beginning of a, of a day where I had tissues in my pocket because I'm Still nursing a cold since my kindergartner started school. I've been sick. Um, and <laughs> get used to it. Um, but I sort of assume those cold, those 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 tissues were for my for my cold. But in the morning, um, we had a sound some three families that were coming off the bus, and um, this was sort of their final destination of San Francisco. They been processed. They come out of the detention center, and this was probably the first moment that they felt like they were in something besides a hostile environment. Um, and so we, we made the sort of a human corridor right on both sides um, of the walkway. And as they came in, we would just we clap, we cheer, um, we say the end of the uh, And um, it touched them in a way that you'd sort of just be like, okay, well, they're just going from point A to B. But the fact that they were so moved gave you some sense into the trauma on the journey to come across the southern border, the trauma that they may have experienced in their home country, um, that such a small gesture meant so much to them, meant that it meant so much to us. And, and you just realize that um, it's that kind of impact. And I love my days at the White House. Um, there were some really 
you know, fun moments of like watching the poker wheel come up or having to direct Reese Witherspoon when she was like lost in, in the in the hallways or calling Meryl Streep when she was trying to meet Michelle Obama. But like, there's nothing, um, and there's a cool moment. Like when you get and you make that human connection and you're like, hey, maybe I'm just a little world. Right. No, this is great. This is phenomenal. And, 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 and these, you know, are, are, you know, what you're saying resonates well with our students because all of them are sort of really working for the same goals. And, and it's really sort of affirming to hear the, the, the gratification at a personal level that you, you're achieving and the wonderful work that you're doing. So it goes without saying that we are facing an unprecedented global refugee crisis. You, UNHCR has determined that right now there are over 89 million people in the world right now who have been forcibly displaced. That is nearly one in every 88 people on Earth. Included in that number are about 27 million refugees, around half of whom are under the age of 18. So we have children, literally millions of children across the world who have been forcibly displaced. There are also millions of what are termed stateless people who have been denied a nationality altogether and lack access to basic rights such as education, healthcare, employment, and freedom of movement. These numbers are staggering, but it also demonstrates the relevance and need of organizations like LIRS. Can you tell us what some of the root causes are that have driven so many people around the world to flee and seek better lives? Um, how many refugees on average come into the U.S. each year and how many people does LIRLs help to resettle? And even more, if I may just quickly, quickly how does LIRS sustain itself? Like who is, who is supporting all of you to do this really important and incredible work? Yeah, all, all great questions. Thanks. I'll try to unpack. Um, you know, so in terms of the root causes, some of them you know well, right? You just have to turn on the TV and you see what's continuing to happen in Ukraine. Um, some of them are slow burning crises, right? When we think about 7 million refugees who have fled Ukraine, well, think about the more than 7 million refugees who have fled Venezuela. Um, and so just recognizing that, unfortunately, we have no control over the sequencing. It ends up not just being crisis after crisis, it's crisis on top of crisis on top of crisis. Um, so there is sort of you know, war, violence, persecution, some of the more traditional reasons that we know um, why, why migrants, um, refugees flee. But then on top of that is this dynamic of climate displacement, where you know, we in our lifetime could likely see um, islands where they will not just become uninhabitable, but we will not be able to see them on our planet anymore. And so when you think about this, this is not just a futuristic dynamic that we have 20 years planned for, right? It's happening today. UNHCR, um, sorry, the Brookings Institution estimates that a third of the migrants we see today are being displaced by climate. And then of course, add to that that it's not one force or the other force that's impacting migration. Oftentimes it's, it's the, the dynamic um, interaction between the two. So for example, you may have a, a farming family in Guatemala that initially experiences crop failure um, as a result of you know, the dry corridor caused by the climate crisis. So that's a climate reason for their initial displacement where they'll move to elsewhere in the country. But then because they are internally displaced, because they are not kind of well situated where they move, they become more vulnerable to gang violence and to being targeted. So then that will lead them to an interna international migration across country borders, and they'll head you know, towards the US. And that's, of course, more traditional reasons for why migration is free. So you'll see you know, um, climate being a primary reason, and then traditional reasons being the secondary reason. But then vice versa, if you look at the Rohingya Muslims, for example, you will see them moving to um, fleeing to Bangladesh for a primary you know, traditional rationale for, for migration. But then because of the concentration of both in the Muslims in a, in a way that's not managed well, it'll create an environmental hotspot because there'll be a stress on water source. And so this is where it's a sad reality uh, because we don't have a single country in the world that recognizes climate migrants in a real way. 
Um, this is why we've been advocated. I, I testified before the Senate Climate Crisis Task Force um, that I believe there's an opportunity for the U.S. to really lead and to be the first nation in the world to create a pathway for climate migration. Um, but that's where I, I do think that we have some real opportunity mm -hmm. to, to move the needle. Um, and then just in terms of how we are funded. So we are a largely federally funded um, nonprofit. And the benefit of, of that is that, um, you know, we have a real wonderful partnership with the federal government, um, which is important when you work in the immigration space, your access to clients, for example, our work with unaccompanied children hinges on those strong partnerships. But of course, the downside is that when you have a previous administration um, that was undertaking a war on immigration and immigrants, um, and there was a slashing of programs across the board, it meant that LIRS went through tough times. And so one of my priorities since I started in 2019 is how do we diversify our revenue? How do we um, realize that there's huge opportunities for us to go to companies, for example, um, and pitch immigration, not as a corporate social responsibility issue, right? right. But as a business bottom line of how do you hire the workforce? Um, so that's how LRS has been trying to kind of expand our horizon. And if you don't mind my asking, ha have you been successful in light of the upcoming elections, perhaps? Or is that something that's on your mind? <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, we are a nonpartisan organization. I um, obviously have my own private views on on what's happening in the world. And and I will tell you, it's, it's tough sometimes because, um, you know, uh, as related to sort of my personal story, I sometimes um, used to say that I know that my daughter's life will be easier because my own parents' lives were hard. And to me, that's the American dream. But I don't know that I actually believe that anymore or, um, you know, believe that that's a guarantee. And to me, that's a really scary proposition, right? And, and, and what, why, why do you say that? Too? Well, I just, I mean, I don't want to get too political here, but I mean, I just, a lot of what I've taken for granted. Um, you know, a strong democracy. Um, you know, uh, my my daughter um, has learned a little bit about Sri Lanka, uh, but you know, she talks about sort of dictators and um, plutocracies, and and my parents risk everything to come to a democracy um, and a meritocracy. And I do feel like there's a lot of dynamics um, that suggest that our assumptions can no longer be taken for granted. That we have to fight for every basic tenet of our society. Um, and that's something where, you know, I, I have debates with friends on like, should my daughter have watched January 6th? And um, we showed her because I want her to understand that we don't live in La La Land, right? We don't live in a bubble. And every single one of us have to do our part. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's where I am such an optimistic person, but I also want us to face the reality so we know what's at stake. Um, LIRS has been around for over 80 years, um, and there have been a number of refugee crises during that time. I should remind our audience of what some of those crises have been. Germans and Hungarians following, following World War II, the Cuban boat people, Uganda during the Idi Amin regime, Vietnam War, and then in more recent years, the crisis in Sudan, the Northern Triangle, Afghanistan, Iraq, Bosnia, Syria, and of course, most recently, Ukraine. Through all of the, those years, LIRS has prided itself on supporting what you all call the long welcome. What exactly does that mean in terms of your core mission? And can you talk about how LIRS has grown these last three years under your leadership and some of the services the organization provides in the spirit of the long welcome or anything else? Yeah, yeah so our hope is um, not to just sort of take the system as it is, because I, I think it's obvious to most people that our immigration system is dysfunctional. And the truth is that that's a dysfunction that existed, you know, before a few years ago, it's been a long standing system that has been broken and needs to be fixed. And so part of our hope has been to realize where there are opportunities for us to um, create a win-win situation. You know, so we're a charitable organization, but the truth is what we do is not charity, right? We set uh, individuals who are new Americans up for success, and we know that it pays huge dividends, right, in terms of the return for our country. Um, so what we believe is that for some of our clients, right, who come with nothing, we're, we're helping, um, you know, those few, first few days, those first few weeks, those first few months in terms of providing affordable housing, and picking them up at the airport, um, furnishing that housing with some modest furniture, um, enrolling their kids in public schools, um, making sure that they have access 
to English as second language classes, um, mentors who can work with the family, uh, people who can guide them on trans public transportation. But, but that is really kind of ensuring survival, right? We want to make sure our clients don't just survive, but they actually thrive. And that's frankly in our self-interest. And so what we try to do is provide um, the additional services, the legal referrals, so that they don't have to navigate the complex labyrinth uh, that is our immigration system. Um, that we're working with employers and providing that counseling. Um, and, and that's where I think there's some real opportunity for us to just change the narrative on immigration. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, a issue I've had since I've worked in this space where a lot of the work, um, a lot of the narrative out there is told by one side. And I think some of the problem that the immigration system um, kind of from our side faces is that many of us are faith-based organizations um, where the strategy is keep your head down, do the good work, hope the rest will speak for itself. And I just think that you have to have lived through the last several years to realize that that's a losing strategy. Um, so part of why, you know, when, when I'm invited onto Glenn Beck, I jump at the opportunity is we've got to get out of our echo chamber, right? We've got to go into the lion's den because I think that we can make the case. We can fight uh, fiction with facts, but we've got to be out there saying, look, immigration is who we are, unless you're indigenous or you came because your family was forced through slavery, someone in your family made a decision to come to this country and thank goodness for that, right? Or just saying, well, economically, inflation, supply chain issues. Well, when you think about how immigration and the lack of a workforce has affected, we pay a price premium, premium for xenophobic and anti-immigration policy. Um, Ukraine and Afghanistan have shown us why is a national security matter. Some of our most ardent advocates are uh, DOD, Pentagon officials. Um, and, you know, for many faith communities, welcoming a stranger is kind of a dictate of, of, of living out our faith. And so that's where I just think that we got to stop being on the defense. We've got to go offense. Um, and so I think there's a huge opportunity for us. And can you say, if you don't mind, to say a little bit more about how do you offensively position yourself in this political landscape? I mean, because you are talking about the yeah. politics. You know, we're dealing with crises where people, you know, the, the, the country seems divided on this issue. And so, you know, putting uh, immigrants on a plane and sending them to Martha Vineyard, some see as a political success story. Others see as just like a, as an embarrassing crisis. Like, how do you play offense in this political landscape? Yeah, and, and it isn't easy because I do think, you know, you're obviously playing into dynamics that can exist, right? Um, so I think some of it is um, uh, basic facts. I feel like maybe I'll start there just because obviously we're in a university setting. But there's a lot of people out there, right, who have no idea when you talk about the southern border. All they hear is that immigrants have made the southern border incredibly dangerous. But when you actually look at the data, the 21 bordering counties of, of, our, of our border are actually safer than when you compare them to interior counties of the same size. Um, you look at, there was a longitudinal study that was done on uh, the top 10 cities that have received refugees. And they looked at crime across the board. And nine of the 10 cities saw a significant drop in crime, whether we're talking about economic crime, violent crime, petty crime. The one exception was West Springfield, Massachusetts, and they were going through an opioid epidemic. Um, it's, you know, so there's lots of stats that are on our side, right? Like we keep hearing this narrative of immigrants coming and being leeches on taxpayer dollars. And it's like, even when you take into account the meager assistance that agencies like LIRS get, get from the federal government, which we subsidize largely through like private fundraising, you know, um, it, it is clear across the board in every country, in every state that, um, that immigrants are a net positive, whether it's spending power, tax, you know, taxes that they pay, et cetera. But then like put aside the stats, right? Because some of us, our eyes are gonna just gloss over when you start talking about all these stats. And some of it is just about value, right? It's about talking about, um, like I tell my immigrant story and some may, people may connect to it, but I tell my husband, Colin Patrick O'Mara, who I think you can tell from the name, is a nice Irish Catholic. And he tells his story and there's gonna be a lot more people who see, you know, dirty blonde, blue eyed guy and they're like, oh, Yes, you know what? They are us. And when he talks about, you know, the dirty Irish who were ostracized, it's just remembering that like this isn't actually something altogether unique. Yes, maybe in the intensity, 
and just like the fact that there does seem to be like no the, the lines that are, are crossed are more extreme but like anti-immigration sentiment is just an age-old phenomenon right mm -hmm. so i think just kind of recognizing that gives me hope but i think some of it is just saying okay look we're an organization that we support immigrants but the bulk of americans are not calling for completely closed borders or completely open borders right most of us are saying that we need to have a system that's orderly that allows people to exercise their legal rights that allows them to ideally you know apply and process their visas in country so that they don't have to undertake these treacherous journeys that the southern border isn't as crowded as we've seen it why did two, why did 20,000 ukrainian refugees come through the southern border when people say well why are they coming to the southern border you know they should come the right way there is no right way right so many of our, our our pathways have been shut down and so i think people understanding that um is really important but we also have to and this is just the final point is um we have to understand what we're up against right there are some very compelling narratives out there um you know when i was in arizona i was just well you know in, in the lead up to the midterms like every single ad's a political ad and many of them were talking about immigration, right? So you have one ad talking about how um, an, an illegal raped a three-year-old. We've got to we've got to recognize that you know it's okay to acknowledge that in the native-born population and the immigration uh, immigrant population, there are some bad apples, right? We acknowledge that, but it's also recognizing that we have to you know we have to talk about some of the fentanyl. Fentanyl has been a very powerful argument that anti-immigrant um, you know, critics are saying, oh, well, it's immigrants that are actually bringing, out, bringing fentanyl. We should talk about that because I think right now you're just hearing radio silence. And, and I, a little bit of this is a lot of my colleagues from the Obama administration are in the Biden administration. Some of the politics of what you're seeing is one party is viewing this as a wedge, wedge issue and the other party is viewing this as their Achilles heel. So they don't want to talk about it. So you have one side on the offensive and one side radio silent. Of course, that's when you can talk. Right, especially in this environment of misinformation and disinformation and people sort of picking up social media and, 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 and seeing this information. I wanna stay on this theme a little bit. Um, so one of our questions for you is, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about this legal entry system? You sort of said right now, the pathways are not available. From where I sit as dean of the school, I know that I am often getting so many inquiries about, well, my visa has not been approved. Uh, we have a lot of visitors. We're trying to internationalize. We think internationalization is very important. We need different perspectives at the school. But what we're suffering, what we deal with on a daily basis is visas are not being issued. Visas are being held up. Visa requirements are requiring people to leave the country, and they don't know if they can come back. So you have to leave the. So in these are, you know, like, again, like uh, that's one level like here that, in, and so like I'm seeing it in a way, even though, you know, my parents were immigrants, I don't deal with visa issues on a daily basis, but I'm seeing it. I'm wondering like, this is just time consuming. It's so expensive. It's causing people to have to think about how to leave, leave their kids or bring their kids or meet their spouses or do what and what country should they go try to get this visa. It's a very complicated set of issues that people are navigating. And there's not much guidance, by the way. Yeah. People are trying to figure out through whatever available resources, which is not really like on a web page. It's just like what you're hearing. So I just, and I will be honest, like I don't have it. So I'll sort of pick up the phone and try to get more advice. And I'm not figuring it out. That's number one. Two, I'm just trying to tie it all together. People keep on, I, what I also see is that like we, we post jobs for any job in the university we, where we used to get like a hundred applications at least for a job. These days we're getting three or four. Um, and even then we try to interview so quickly and give the job so quickly and they've already accepted another job. The labor shortages in this country, I haven't seen anybody deliberately link it to all this stumbling that people say, well, we, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the stimulus payments, not to get political, but the stimulus payments kept people at home. They didn't want to work. They became lazy. But nobody's saying that people are scared to come to this country, that we've made it difficult for labor to come to this country at, uh, at all levels, skilled and unskilled. And from where you stand, like, why isn't anybody sort of calling it out or having this conversation and being proactive at it? Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 like, 
tie it into the legal thing. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. So I, I think it is really important because um, those people, uh, those who, the majority of people, right, who are quite reasonable, um, do keep saying, well, they have to come the right way, right? Or, well, they're coming for economic reasons. And it's like, well, why did some number of our, our ancestors come? It may have been, you know, for my husband's family, it was the, the potato famine, right, in Ireland. Like, I, I don't know when economic reasons became a bad rationale to come to the U.S., but we are privileged. Well, people risk their lives to come to us because of, of who we are and what we stand for, right? And so I think that that's where, you know, think about just refugee numbers. The refugee numbers are set by the president in, in, a, in a, a process called the presidential determination. The president gets to unilaterally decide what that number is. So you can literally go from one president who sets it at 110,000 to another president who sets, sets it at 15,000 to back, you know, under this administration, back to 125,000 in theory, but the problem was that um, even under the Biden administration, setting it at 125,000, the first year was about 15,000. The second year um, has, uh, has this year we actually got to 35,000. And look, I mean, you know, that doesn't take into account the Afghan evacuation. And so the administration has been trying to make some strides. But, but this is where the refugee number, when we are at historic high refugee numbers, the idea that the US would be at what had been historic lows, um, is mind-boggling, right? It's it's not consistent with with where the need is. When you think about the fact that um, you know Congresswoman Lofgren has been trying to figure out are there issues that are bipartisan. So one issue that had been bipartisan was um, there's caps on countries in terms of how many green cards can be issued. Right. So India has the same cap right. as a small country. This has obviously created a huge issue, right? So when she had last year a hundred and I think it was eleven. Uh, Republican co-sponsors. This year, she had nine. And she fought for every single one of those nine. And she was training relationships um, to get those. We have visas that are for nurses that have expired, um, even as we face nurse shortages, right? And so I think that this is where, uh, you know, it's mind numbing when you think how we are hurting ourselves just to make a political statement. Um, last year, we had the lowest immigration into the country since 2010. And so on the kind of workforce front, it's just an important dynamic to understand, right, where the U.S. has the lowest birth rate since the census has been tracking this issue. We have a workforce that is aging at such a rapid pace that we're not going to be able to replace those that are in the workforce. And, and we look at uh, economies like Japan, right, that have faced stagnancy, and, and that's where we're headed unless we do something real about it. And that's where immigration has to be a part of the solution. And so why aren't people having this conversation? Because you, know, you could also link the inflation crisis to this as well, right? When the cost of labor have just almost doubled in the, in the last few years, um, we're coming out of a pandemic. Like, why isn't this a, a, more, a, a major argument in the national conversation right now? Like, with all due respect, like, if you don't mind my asking, like, what is LIR, not to put the burden on you, I know that you're nonpartisan, but like, how do you get this conversation going? Yeah, so every time we do a, um, a TV hit, we sort of you know, talk about whatever's the issue of the day for why they invited us on. Mm -hmm. But then you know, I try to sort of pivot to that message to the broad, broader audience, which is the price premium you pay for anti-immigrant and xenophobic stances is milk. It's eggs, right? It's your coffee shop being closed two days a week. Um, and I think, the problem, though, is that like you know we can be a mouthpiece for it, right. but you gotta have political leaders who are willing to even talk about immigration. And I think some of the strategy, especially in the lead up to the midterms, has been let's not talk about it. Let's see, and you know we are hopeful. But let's see what happens after next Tuesday. What people may have viewed as um, kryptonite, they may be willing to talk. And so on. On this, also, Chris, um, you know, just just. I, I do want to make sure I, I, I ask time, and we're good on time, right? We're at one thirty. Oh, really? Okay, so then I mean, I've got two quick questions then. I did want to make sure I do spend a little bit time on this xenophobia, the rise of xenophobia, if that's what we want to call it. Um, it, it, it 
a lot, you mentioned this a lot in your talk about driving the anti-immigrant sentiment that in, in, in the end, it, it's not sort of like rational on an economic perspective. It's not really rational from a political perspective that it might be uh, a lot of it uh, in terms of xenophobia. Um, how do you see LIRS working in that space and what can we uh, or outside audiences do to sort of ensure that our society doesn't become a society of just you know in increasing levels of hatred and, and racism and discrimination, things of that sort, first. But second, also for our students in the audience, a lot of them care about this issue deeply and fundamentally. And as they're thinking about their careers or how they can help or chart out their careers, what advice would you give them in terms of next steps for both our master's students, but our undergraduates as well? Yeah, yeah, Thank great, you. okay. Thank yeah, so I'll, I'll take the questions in reverse order. So in terms of kind of what you could be literally doing right now, um, my knowledge of social media is limited to LinkedIn, if you would call that social media, but I guess most, most people would not, um, Twitter and Facebook. And Twitter, even now, I'm debating kind of what's my, my future uh, on that platform. So you're savvier than I and many of our staff. So if you have any bandwidth to amplify, if you have the ability to kind of message in your own way, like we need an army of people who are making the case on this issue. Um, we are also hiring. So if you're thinking about internships, uh, we've hired 177 staff. This year, we are still hiring 166 of staff. We, uh, you know, we you have labor shortages too. Yes, we do. Um, you know, and so when you think about, you know, we're an 83 year organization, 83 year old organization. Um, I think of myself as the head of an 83 year old startup. Uh, we have gone through exponential growth, and we, we need um, that that uh, you know we, we need that capacity. So please consider um, applying to LIRS. But then I think in terms of just like what that pathway looks like, um, you know, uh, there's no one recipe, but I do find what's exciting about, uh, I was gonna say our generation, um, don't correct me on that, I'll say our generation um, opportunity when it comes to career is, you know, you won't necessarily just have one role or one uh, sector that you'll work in for 30 years, right? We jump from thing to thing to thing. And so I think that means create these opportunities where you can dabble, because certainly in my role, I find that pretty much every opportunity that I was able to um, uh, you know, enjoy has been hugely helpful to my role, right? I know enough law to be dangerous. Um, you know, I, 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 can, I can manage uh, a P&L statement because of, of a little bit of time I spent um, in the private sector. I, I just think that this is your chance now to, to dabble, but in an intentional way. Um, in terms of kind of how we, um, address xenophobia, I, we have to, I think, segment the audience, right? So some Americans are, are just so deeply threatened. Um, I don't know if it's white replacement therapy, a theory, I don't know what it is, but there may be some number of folks that we will never reach. But there are gonna be other folks, depending on what argument you use, that you can convince them, right? And some of this is just starting with that conversation of saying, you know, oh, did you do mean, what is that mean? 23, that like this. 23 and me, yes. I, I sort of, I've been like dreaming of a partnership <laughs> with them because that's what we all need to know, right? Which is, where do we trace our roots to? So when you talk about they, like how do I convince people that they are us? It's just the newest wave of it. And so this is where, when you think about, you know, the, the advances we've made with gay marriage, I think some of this is just forcing that interaction uh, because it is true that most people do rely on an immigrant labor force in some way, shape, or form, right? In right, the, right? And then some of it is really like having those tough conversations. Like, I'm going to Florida next week. We'll go into the villages, which is sort of Trump's um, stomping ground, to talk about immigration. And I have never once gone into one of these harder conversations, um, come out and felt like, wow, that was just a waste of time. I actually think that it is probably the best use of my time is going in there rather than an echo chamber because right. that's what I worry. I mean, I'm sure you worry about this too, just the broader dynamics of like, what's the glue of our society? Right. If social media is amplifying extreme voices, we're all going into our corners and not having these hard conversations. Right, and, and not creating the fora for these sort of conversations to happen in ways where we can really just take on the points. Um, 
So with that, Chris, I want to say that this is all very amazing. I'm a huge fan and admirer. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, we at SPI are very proud of you, and uh, we would like to open up for Q and A. Back here, over here. Can you can you introduce yourself? you know, the pull factors of the economics of our country, I feel in some ways that it's simplified and doesn't consider the larger, you could say grim narrative of the ways we've uh, contributed to the current global world order. Um, so I'm just curious, like what alternative models you have for viewing migration that aren't as, as simple as the economic thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and the reality is it's, it's quite messy, right? Like. Um, uh, you know, there's a um, Cato Institute did an interesting study about the southern border where they looked at, uh, depending on how you craft your visa allocation, um, if you increase the number of economic visas, uh, for every one economic visa you increase by, you reduce um, irregular migration at the southern border of Mexican nationals by two, right? And so just realizing that all of these systems have um, some connection. Like when I talk about my family having left Sri Lanka, we didn't come as refugees. We came in 1980, which was the same year that the 1980 Refugee Act happened. It just was that my uncle, um, who was a neurosurgeon, went to Texas and he sponsored the rest of the family because uh, he knew that we were all part of the ethnic and religious minority and we all needed to get out. And so I think just realizing that um, there are a lot of factors that are causing people to flee. Um, even just the credible fear interviews that our Customs and Border Protection agents um, mm -hmm. facilitate, they're undertaking these with oftentimes a language barrier. And you have to answer right the right way in these questions or you're out, right? You're, that, that's it. Um, and I think that that's where uh, we are sometimes a little bit too simplistic um, uh, on, on how we uh, kind of approach the dynamics because they are complex. Right, it could be, and is oftentimes that there is a reason, like uh, you know, gang violence, um, corruption, um, uh, you know, tar a specific targeting of a family for being associated with a political group that will lead them to start migrating in the first place. But yes, they oftentimes will come to the U.S. because we are viewed as the land of opportunity, and so I think that's where we need to have a system that isn't uh, as simple as like it's it's not a black and white model right where it's lots of gotcha questions and if you you know fail one answer you're you're gone it's just understanding and recognizing and being able to process all of those very important inputs as we make decisions on who gets in and who gets out knowing that that decision is a life not just life changing but life saving over here Heather I'm Liam McGuire um uh, you made a point at the beginning about um, America's role in prioritizing climate refugee policy. And it made me think of the Kiribati citizen who claimed climate refugee status in New Zealand. Ultimately, UNHCR said that they could not be deported back on the basis of being a climate refugee. And then there since have been conversations about you know, bilateral labor and migration agreements between New Zealand and other Pacific Island countries, um, which I think has been a really interesting and progressive progressive model, but obviously uh, America does not have the same progressive policies as New Zealand. So I, I'm curious about how you see America's role in this international push when there are so many hurdles to fixing our own domestic um, system. Yeah, yeah. Um, great question, uh, great knowledge. So if you are thinking about internships here, standing, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, it's probably in every single one of these positions still. <laughs> um, but we are making a major push on climate displacement, so uh, you know where to find it. Um, <laughs> the UNHCR, and this was the UN High, Human Rights Committee, um, as opposed to High Commissioner for Refugees' decision. Um, what was interesting about it was it kind of created this opening, right? It sort of signaled that this individual didn't face such an imminent life-saving kind of danger that justified their release 
immediately, but that there was a pathway where, for some people, right, where you can say literally this land is going underwater, um, that they're not, there is an opportunity. Um, so, so we, you know, we certainly mm -hmm. do um, as hopeful that that decision. Where I think that the U.S. can play a role is one, just recognizing that that example feels so far away from us, right? But when you think about the fact that even off the coast of Louisiana, right, on the Ile de Jean Charles, we actually have uh, American um, indigenous population that is receiving taxpayer dollars to relocate because their land is going underwater. You realize that this is a very real threat. Now, the question is, where does that lead us, right? Because on the one hand, you could say, well, that empathy that maybe Americans won't necessarily understand when it comes to, you know, a, a civil war, because depending on how you view what's been happening as of late, um, you know, you would say that that just feels too foreign. This is something that, you know, sort of Americans are thinking about making a, a, a decision on relocation related to climate. Um, you know, you go to Miami, we're talking about climate gentrification. So I think that this is a dynamic that can come home to the US. So the question is, how do we decide on the side of how to go to Mexico? Are we at time? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I think well, that, so I, I think the fact is um, when you think about the fact that by there will be 216 million climate displaced persons, well, that just feels a little alarming. And I could imagine that America saying, you know what, well, we have our own climate issues. We can't take anything else. But on the other hand, I feel like there's a way in which the US could and should say. We played a hugely prominent role in creating these. So we owe something. So what we've been trying to say is that one pathway is, is to recognize that our asylum law um, does uh, acknowledge serious harm. And there are people who are being displaced who would suffer serious harm. And so we don't need to make changes in US law in order to accept them. The more kind of ambitious strategy is the second pathway, which is to say the US has an opportunity to kind of create this new pathway that frankly every single country that's capable should open because that is the only way we deal with a global crisis at the kind of scale of the talking over here hey, i'm barbara but i'm also first person um there's a lot of talk about uh, promoting migration as a source of labor um both unskilled and skilled as you mentioned uh, but the flip side of that is that people often see migration as a way of um, and so I just wanted to know what your organization does, what policies you've seen that kind of help promote migration in that way that ensure that that exploitation doesn't take place. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, and obviously, you know, this is where LIRS, we can play our part, but like this is where, you know, um, some of the interesting trends with unionization are, are I think, going to be very valuable um, in terms of broader dynamics. I see it every day because I see CEOs who will call me from everything from um, software companies to landscaping companies, hospitality. And I can notice that even in the conversation in the community, where they seem to think that like you're their HR department, and they'll be like, yeah, I, I really need 60 people by December 1st. I'm like, I'm sorry, do you pay my salary? Like, where does this come from? Um, and it's pivotal for organizations like LIRS. To, to play an ongoing role. So we launched a what we call preferred uh, employer program where it's about, you know, you go through um, an orientation. We want you to understand the cultural sensitivities. We also want you to understand that you've got to approach your clients, our clients, um, holistically, right? So we need to have conversations about what are you going to help with affordable housing, transportation subsidies. Um, so that we can make sure that our clients are supported. And our pitch to employers is this is a win-win for you in the long term too, because we don't want to, right? So we're going to express to you what are the great, you know, the greatest um, and most urgent needs that our clients face. We can together figure it out. You're not going to have to provide everything, but let's work together to see what we can offer, what we can partner to offer, and what we can create. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Professor Breland, and then we're going to take how much time do we have? Professor. So we'll take Professor Breland, and then okay, okay. Can, let's, can we take them now? We need two and two. 
That's a really good way. So, um, first, I, th I think I should just reveal to the audience that um, Krish was my student. Let's not reveal how many years ago. <laughs> she was in the first lecture class that I ever taught in my life. And um, was one he of the lecture? He was. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of funny. But first, I just wanted to say that because, like, this can be you. I mean, I don't know if anyone can achieve what you achieved, but she started just like you guys, you know, um, in, a, in, a, in a slightly, you know, a little further east school. But, um, but, 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 you know, I knew her when she was at your stage, um, and 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 you guys should set your eyes. Um, thinking back to those days, I have to say, when I first heard you were running for governor of Maryland, a part of me was thinking about the time. Do you remember that I was teasing you about the flag of Maryland? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Which I still think is ridiculous. <laughs> But she had a love of Maryland. And when I heard you running, I said, well, she was not kidding. She really <laughs> loves Maryland. And I know that you love also this country. And I'm just curious, you know, how much does patriotism kind of drive you? And I don't think it's a coincidence that your family moved here. How much like patriotism do you sense in the people that you love that are coming? Yeah, and, and I should also um, say, uh, Professor Vreeland, um, I, I truly believe that I'm sure I would have gotten to where I got today <laughs> you without your me. help because you were hugely supportive. And not even when I was at your stage, I didn't know anything. <laughs> like, I came to college thinking, ah, this is where you learn. Like, all of these things. And I was like, oh, wow, these kids like come here. And he's like, that was not. But anyway, I, I am very grateful to you. So many years. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it is true that I, I am a, um, a huge patriot. Uh, every time I sort of see uh, one of these large flags flown in a way that sometimes I view as it being weaponized, yeah. I just, it worries me because I feel so strongly about what that represents. Um, but it's also interesting because, you know, uh, when I ran for office, um, people would say, okay, well, I think this then president. And I was just like, certainly not. Um, but but uh, but you know, people would be like, oh, well, she can't. She's not. A, she she was not born here. And there are parts of me I think about how odd it is that someone who was you know came here when they were nine months old, arguably kind of cares as much, if not more, mm -hmm. because I know that this is something that I don't take for granted. Um, it is amazing when you go to a these um, citizenship ceremonies. And please, if you haven't gone, go to one. Because we, we hosted one here at Sia. Oh, it's amazing. It's it's small. Amazing. Yeah. You just realize the attitude that people feel. And and the data proves it out, right? Like, even I'm just going to use one data point of, of Fortune 500 companies, nearly half have been created by an immigrant or the child. And you don't have to, right? Like, I don't want. To create this utilitarian argument that we just we have to get value from our immigrant population, but it is really amazing because they knew what the alternative was, and they knew and they know what what this country stands for and everything that it represents, and it is really amazing. That's so awesome. And then our students have to start going to their classes, so I know we have. You want to ask really here and here and here really just really quick, yeah. and then you have to run. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much, um, first year MP student. Um, my question is just about the cap that you had mentioned about um, the president sets each year for refugees. Um, I'm wondering, um, is what if if there are any strategies for how to get make sure the Biden administration next year gets to that 125,000 annually, and if there are any ways or um, strategies for making that number more consistent, even across like president presidential changes um, that are visible. Yeah, great. Right here. Hi, thank you so much for speaking with all time. My name is Linda Blow and I'm also a master's student. Um, my question was that, as you mentioned, the cap hit on our time when it comes to both the benefits of migration and the need to have a more welcoming system, but something isn't resonating with part of the public. So what do you think are some effective strategies to change that? Is it targeting politicians who are willing to make a stand on the issue? Is it advocacy campaigns? 
is it one-on-one -on -one conversations? What do you think would be most effective there? Excellent. Yeah, thank you. I'm Sandra Bouman, uh, connected to immigration, Jordanian, working in Kuwait, and now visiting Scala in the United States. Um, uh, just to say a little bit of the time side of immigration in, in the United States and the Western countries comparing with other states, uh, countries like the Gulf, you have people, they don't know the meaning of being a citizen or being a full-time resident. They stay even 30 years, they can stay until they just renew their residency and, and they don't, we don't call them like immigration or citizen. So this is a good side. But at the same time, I, be, I agree with you that when dealing with immigration uh, immigration and refugees, it's complicated issues. The Gulf countries are generous in getting money around overseas to settle refugees, but they're not opening their doors. So I, I believe that we should look at each country in like a specific way and specific uh, case. For, but for you as a nonprofit advocacy uh, and working in there, one of the things that we should keep in mind, not just not deal with results and deal with the causes, you uh, as preventing instead of dealing with the cures, like especially when you're dealing with the United Nations, UNHCR, different, those are the ones who can go to New York and, and say something that let's prevent crisis. And this is our role as a politician and political thoughts to say, let's do preventing and, and instead of giving housing and blankets and doing that. So this is just to keep it in mind. And, and I don't want to make it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so just really quickly. Um, so in terms of how do we make a case, um, obviously, as I said, I think it is the very sophisticated strategy of throwing the spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, right? The value of immigration, I mean, the wonderful part of immigration in our arguments is that we have a range of arguments we've got to make them. But we also have to realize that me, as the head of the immigration nonprofit, there's a discount, right, in what I say. And so this is where every single one of us coming from our different vantage points needs to make the argument. This is why we talk to veterans. That's why we talk to business leaders. That's why we talk to conservatives. Because we, they're still out there, right? They, they still make these arguments. We need to understand what their voices. Um, in terms of the uh, the refugee cap. So I think candidly with this administration, we need to say, this is the year you have to own it. There's no excuses of, oh, we're rebuilding, we're rebuilding because you know we're halfway, we're halfway through their, their term. Um, and I think some of it is also we can't go through this roller coaster ride of each time a president comes in, they change it. We've been advocating for something called the Grace Act, which would set the um set the 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 floor. The ceiling could be higher, but the floor would be ninety-five thousand, which is what it has been if you take all the administrations across the board. Reagan actually resettled the highest number of refugees of any president. Mm -hmm. Um resettled over two hundred thousand. Um, so that's where I think that there are ways in which we can try to make this bipartisan, but we're going to have to find that opening where this issue is not at the core of the issue. And, and, and the causes versus, uh, I mean, that's probably, probably above your paper. I agree. Uh, the, the problem is that, yeah, those, uh, I, I wish I could solve the war and, and climate, but completely agree that if, if we don't do more on the preventative side, I don't know that we can catch up on, on resettling. The, the hundreds of millions of people that we're talking about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.